Hi, this is Chris Castle, and you're listening to Your Morning Coffee, the podcast with Jay Gilbert and Mike Etchert. Weekly music news for the new music business. Media Music Forecast, the new era of growth. Illuminate releases 2022 U.S. Mid-Year Report. We'll break it down. And also for media, changing streaming's royalty model will unlock a new music economy. And by the way, get out your acronym decoder ring because we've got a new one for you related to that particular story. So, Jay, what do you say? We buckle in, we kick back, we hit the play button because here we go. Stand by for transmission. This is London Calling. Wake up! Your morning coffee, on the air, 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 on the for the new music business. It's the highly curated, agitated, advocated, moderated, and liberated digital music information that you need to know. We are your digital music authority. And now from our studios in Hollywood, California, here's your hosts, Jay Gilbert and Mike Etchart. Jay, we are heading into the hundreds, the 100s, episode 101. And couldn't be more excited to to enter the next hundred of the podcast, as you said last time. <laughs> they said it would never last, and yet here we are. We are yeah. continually, yeah. and and I will tell you, as I did just before we hit play. I mean, every week of the newsletter is is really fantastic, and if you. Don't subscribe to the newsletter. I'm going to guess that most people that listen to this have. But if you don't, do get it. It is such a valuable resource. And I know you spend a ton of time pulling everything together. Um, You are that student, as I always say in high school, who I always wanted to buddy up to because I knew he had studied. And I knew he was prepared for the exam. (laughs) And I wanted to just sit to his left and just kind of glance at his paper and see where he was going with those answers. So it's it's. But this particular week, Jay, was unbelievable. So many fantastic stories. It really was. It was an embarrassment of riches with all of the reports that came out this week, all of the great stories. A lot of them we won't get a chance to talk about today. But as you mentioned, just subscribe to your morning coffee, the newsletter. It's the easiest URL ever uh, to remember. It's just yourmorning.coffee. That's it. Yep www.yourmorning.coffee. Subscribe to the uh, newsletter. Comes out every Friday, super early. But yeah, there were so many great stories about you know country artists who are now sharing a percentage of their revenue from the master and mm-hmm. uh, to songwriters, uh, which is really new and exciting. Um, just so many things to to talk about. But uh, let's dig in because we've got some really great things to talk about this week. Oh, and before I forget. Um, we are dropping that bonus episode uh, that we teased out last week. Mm-hmm. Um, that'll be coming in the next day or two. And that is an amazing conversation with Will Page. Yeah, it really was. Of course, he is the former economist from Spotify and a very charming guy. He's the author of Tarzan Economics, which, as we told him then, and it's funny that he name checked the the Don Passman book because I think of Tarzan Economics. I mean, there's literally like four books, maybe, that are like essential reads, absolutely yes. essential reads yep. you must have on your on your bookshelf, you're in your office. Um, and so it was just such a treat to chat with him because, you know, I've certainly read yeah. his stuff and oh, I've heard gosh. him being interviewed, but he's 
a very charming guy. And he's very, what's so interesting about him is he's, you know, he's, he's got this career as an economist and he's a very learned man. And he reminds me of, of the, a lot of the professors that I had when I was studying economics, in quotation marks, studying, if, I, if you call it that. Um, I was in the class. I, I'm not sure how awake I was. But he's, he's one of those people that you, you know, he, he makes things that are fairly complex sound very simple and relatable, which is, which is huge. Yeah, but it he's, helps you understand. Yeah. Him. So he can talk all day about economics and all that stuff, but he's also a DJ. He's also has this interesting career on with, for just being a, an artist. And it's refreshing to meet yeah. people like that, 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 that yeah. not only know the nuts and bolts, but also are creative and also participate in the yeah. creation and, of music. Yeah. And you know that, in addition to recording three podcasts every week, I listen to a lot of podcasts. You know, I, I think I've said many times on the show, you know, I start my day very early in the morning. I go for a five mile walk. And as I'm doing that, I'm listening to podcasts typically. And there's one podcast that I never miss. And that's Will Page um, and Richard Kramer. They do this bubble trouble. Mm-hmm. And it's about, you know, economics. Yeah. But it's... um as you know, economics isn't always about financial markets. It's it's about what motivates human behavior, yeah. incentives, and it's so much more than what you might think it is. And someone like Will Page takes maybe something that could be dry um, and really makes it funny and makes it interesting. And he helps, you know, even knuckleheads like us wrap our heads Absolutely. around what he's talking well, about. Well, and he's much in line with, you know, there was that book Freakonomics that came out, I think, in the early 2000s. And um, and that was such a, uh, an impactful book uh, in terms of the field of economics. You know, it really humanized yeah. the, the, it is known as the dismal science. And... <laughs> Which is just the greatest line. Um, but, you know, it humanizes it. And as you said, you know, economics is part psychology, it's part sociology, and it's part business. And so all of those things kind of factor in. But Will really makes things super easy to understand. And it's yeah. just, he was a, a, a real treat to chat with him and such a charming yeah, guy. Yeah, don't, you don't want to miss this one. We got to talk about our sponsors, Jay, because, you know, if it wasn't for our sponsors, we would not be able to pull this whole thing off. So I do want to thank, you know, uh, Your Morning Coffee podcast is also is brought to you by our friends at Bandzoogle, built by musicians for musicians. For musicians, Bandzoogle is an all-in-one platform that makes it easy to build a beautiful website for, and EPK for your music. All the features you need for a professional website are already built in. Hosting and a custom domain name, dozens of fully customizable design templates, tools to sell your music and merch commission-free, commission-free crowdfunding and fan subscription features, mailing list tools to grow your fan list and send and yes and send newsletters, um, uh, social media integrations, and live support support from their music musician friendly team 7 days a week and that musician friendly team is truly a musician friendly yes, team because is. they're all musicians. Yeah. <laughs> your music uh, your morning coffee podcast listeners can go to bandzoogle.com to try it free for 30 days and use the promo code morning coffee all one word and get 15% off your first year of any subscription that's bandzoogle.com promo code morning coffee. Oh, yeah. And we have to thank our friends, uh, Bruce Houghton and, and all those fine folks over at HypeBot. Since 2004, HypeBot has chronicled the new music business and the trends and technologies that are changing how music is discovered, consumed, marketed, and monetized. Edited daily by founder Bruce Houghton, with help from Alana Bonilla, HypeBot and sister blog Music Think Tank are published by live music discovery and marketing platform Bands in Town. Speaking of Bands in Town, over 65 million live music fans trust Bands in Town to get personalized concert alerts, recommendations, and messages from their favorite artists. It's the number one artist services platform connecting over 550,000 artists with their super fans. Managers, labels, agencies, and artists access their own dashboard to manage and promote their tour dates across all platforms. Also, uh, don't forget to sign up for the new uh, Bands in Town artist community at community.artists.bandsintown.com. And indeed, and the guy that I get to chat with every week, not only every week, we actually 
communicate almost every day, sometimes every <laughs> hour, is none other than Jay Gilbert. He is the co-founder of music marketing and strategy company Label Logic. He is the curator of the Your Morning Coffee newsletter and a former executive with Universal Music, Sony Music, and Warner Music Groups, and Fox Home Entertainment, and a ballroom dancer in his spare time, and a music right. freak. <laughs> And Mike Etchart, this guy is sitting across from me that I can see, but you can't. A uh, longtime host of Sound and Vision Radio, formerly of SST Records. He's actually uh, going to give us a book report on that uh, new uh, book that's out on SST Records. Um, and Warner Music, Capital EMI, and Universal Music Groups. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, indeed. And I will, I'm not finished with the book yet. <laughs> it's a great book. Oh my goodness. Right. It's so fun to, to read that stuff. So anyway, so let's jump yeah. into the stories, Jay. This yeah. first one is MIDI of Music Forecast, the new era of growth. Right. And, uh, and as I was saying before, stuff. right, you know, this is really um, another look at where the music business is going through 2030 and the really popular one that people refer to as Goldman Sachs, but there are others. And this is a little bit different take on it. And it's something that Will Page addresses in our bonus episode, which is going to drop in the next day or so. Um, but let's just dig right in. So Midia just published you know, their latest music forecasts, and they talk about how 2020 was, 2021 was such a huge year uh, for recorded music. You know, retail value is up 23%. You know, uh, label trade revenue is up 20%. You know, so that's up to 20, almost $23 billion. Huge, right? And we talked about how in dollars, that's the highest that the industry has ever had. But when you adjust for inflation, it's not the biggest year yet, but we won't. Which let is facts. still amazing to me. You know, yeah. it's like we still haven't hit that 1999 real right. number in terms of of, of value or, or the, the revenue for the music industry, which is pretty amazing. Yeah. And the thing that really jumped out at me, and we'll, we'll dig into this, is that it wasn't just about streaming. There was this thing they call non-DSP streaming. And Will will talk about mm -hmm. that in our bonus episode, too. Non-DSP streaming. And that was worth $3 billion last year you know, across masters, publishing, and platforms. And what's going on is there, there's a couple of things. People are buying up rights. You know, we talk about that, you know, the hypnosis, KKR, BMG, primary wave, all of that stuff. But there's also new players in the space that we didn't have five years ago. Things like Peloton, right, um, which is a top 10 account, as Will points out, uh, for most record companies. Um, things like Roblox and TikTok and social media that is generating a lot of revenue uh, for the music business. So this forecast, you know, from... You know, I guess it goes all the way to 2030, is very encouraging. Absolutely. They, of course, they also talked a lot about emerging markets. Um, Asian markets in particular will become the engine room of, subscri of subscriber growth. Mm. Uh, the Asia Pacific region alone will have uh, like half a billion subscribers by 2030. China accounted for 39% of global subscriber growth in 2021. So it is uh, interesting to, you know, we, we and that's, that's I think, I, you know, I remember even in our days, you know, there was always that, uh, um, international person in the office, <laughs> but they were down the hall. And, you know, we always were focusing so much, of course, on the market that we were, we worked in, which was the U S market, but it is such a global business now. And even then yeah. it was a global business, but it was, we were pretty myopic in, in most record companies, I think, uh, uh, you know, in terms of just focusing on the U S and maybe the UK and, you know, Germany and Japan, yeah. but nothing I, like, like the, the, the markets now that, that are really coming into play. Yeah. I really saw that starting to change in the early 2000s um, mm -hmm. when, uh, when I was at Universal. I remember having meetings in New York with some of our counterparts in UK, France, Germany, Italy, Spain. And it really started then, at least, you know, for me to start working with these international folks. And then, you know, you mentioned that I, I did uh, a tour of duty with Fox Home Entertainment. That was all yeah. international. There was nothing yes, in the U.S. That and that was really a learning experience for me about the cultures, but also how they conduct business. And, mm -hmm. you know, for or five years, I managed uh, Amazon's business for WIA ADA. And that was, you know, with the global teams as well. And it's just really an education. Um, you really need to deal with um, ex-U.S. territories to understand uh, the business. And I think lately there have been 
well, there's Latin music is blown up. You know, we're going to talk totally. a little bit coming up, you know, like with Bad Bunny and, and just Latin music in general. It's not this kind of regional Mexican thing and hasn't been for quite a long time. It's a global thing and it's getting bigger mm -hmm. and bigger. You talk about K-pop and just, you know, BTS and how just massive these things are. And because of streaming, it's less and less about you know, uh, these regional things, it's becoming, you know, you can access them uh, on a global basis. And I think that's a beautiful thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. When, of course, the internet, you know, has really globalized and made the world smaller. And so, you know, kids and, and music fans are, it's so much easier now to learn about stuff. And of course, on YouTube and, and all the streaming services, it's just, just so much there. And uh, there's not sort of the, um, I'm not, I don't know if hesitancy is the right word, but I think in, in our era, especially growing up as music fans and kids, if something was in a foreign language, it's like, nah, nah move, move on. And, and I think music consumers today are much more broad in their scope and interest in music in terms of yeah. what they listen to and what, what you know, and, and they're curious. And, and that yeah. makes it really fun. Yeah, I agree. Uh, so this, uh, this media report, it talks about um, the, the forecast for streaming will be 82% of the business in 2030 globally. Um, it's already there in the U.S. We're at 83% roughly um, of the market in the U.S. is streaming. It's about, yes. I think it's around 60, last time I checked, 60, 65% uh, globally. But they, uh, they predict that that's going to be 82% by 2030. And they also talk about other things, other dynamics that will underpin this overall market growth. And let's, let's look at uh, a few of those. I'll take the first one, which is subscriptions, you know, increased ARPU. And you'll, you'll remember, mm -hmm. uh, we talk about that quite a bit, average uh, revenue per user, increased ARPU in Western markets and increased subscribers in emerging markets. Europe and North America will represent just 23% subscriber growth uh, they predict between 2021 and 2030. So there's a lot of comp, a lot of discussion about non DSP uh, uh, monies coming in. Emerging social games and metaverse platforms will offer new licensing opportunities. Non DSP provides a licensing and business model framework for future emerging consumer technologies. Right, and and another thing that they're saying is going to you know help with this growth is emerging markets and we touched on that a little bit and it's super important you know asian markets in particular you know they're going to become the engine room for subscriber growth they say you know asian pacific region alone will have a half a billion subscribers by 2030 china accounted for 39 percent of global subscriber growth in 2021 and speaking of the U.S., even though the U.S. will lose a share of subscriber growth by 2030 due to China's growth, it will drive the largest share of subscription revenue growth and will remain the world's largest market by 2030 in revenue terms. So, of course, we will also be just because it's the prices will be the higher here, bigger ARPU here, and so it's still going to be a, a important cog in that. But we will be having a little, uh, a little loss of share of, of subscriber growth. Yeah, and the other thing that's really interesting, and we talk about this in the interview with Will Page, this Malbec anomics, <laughs> and what that is <laughs> is he compares the cost of uh, wine to yes. music, and they address that here with subscriber ARPU, um, average revenue per user, will grow by more than seven percent globally, and they think that's going to be lifted by price increases of somewhere around 17%. And that's something that we've talked about quite a bit is that, you know, we haven't really seen much as far as price increases when it comes to streaming. And Will points this out, you know, whether it's Rhapsody that had maybe 15,000 tracks, well, that was nine ninety nine a month, way back in the day. Well, here mm -hmm. we are with 80 million tracks and it's still nine ninety nine, And, you know, it we keep... Is, yeah. Yeah, we we it's it's such a value, and you know we we talked about this with Will, which is you know Netflix makes no bones about it when they raise their rates, they raise their rates, and uh, I think Netflix is up to fifteen ninety nine a month now, and you know music also I think anyway it's the least likely to be canceled by people, um, and it's just it's stunning that we're still at that nine ninety nine more or less price point, right. 
And as you pointed out in our conversation, like who's going to be the first to do that, yeah. right? So those are four really important things um, that really lead Mark and his team over at Media to believe that these forecasts are, are going to be accurate. One, subscriptions. Two, non-DSP, super important. Three, emerging markets. And then four, the overall business in the U.S. So, you know, it was a combination of these factors, you know, forecasting non-DSP for the very first time, actually, and accounting for the exceptional performance of China last year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's really what led, you know, Midia to forecast, you know, uh, you know, it's going to increase around 25%. They believe that this significant increase, which is their biggest um, forecast ever, um, reflects the new potential of the global music business as it enters this new chapter, and that's going to be shaped by non-DSP, Web3, and emerging markets. Super important. But they also mentioned at the end of this, he said, but... And it wouldn't be a media report without a but. Uh, this bullish outlook <laughs> coincides with the global economy on the brink of entering a tailspin. So to be mm. prudent, media's forecasts also include a detailed bear scenario data set with labeled trade revenues slowing to just 3% for 2022. And from there, adding just another 14% or so by 2030. He said, we think the bear scenario is unlikely to play out to stop... To stop <laughs> excuse me, despite being within the realms of possibility, should the global economy slow, then the likelihood is that while music will prove to to will, will prove not be rep recession proof it will neither be recession it will also not be recession vulnerable so that's kind of an interesting point is that it's not necessarily recession proof but it's also not recession vulnerable well as dennis miller always you know ended his uh, monologues with of course that's just my opinion I could be wrong. So look, these are forecasts. You know, nobody has the crystal ball. But I think if you do the due diligence and you look at all of the, you know, the variables like they do here, I think you're go going to have a, a pretty accurate forecast. They've got a pretty good track record. And I encourage everybody to listen to our bonus episode with Will Page dropping in the next day or so. He's going to dig into this in a different way uh, than Mike and I kind of, we, we look at it, you know, on the surface for what it is. And he kind of digs into uh, this whole forecast thing in a really uh, deeper way. So uh, yeah. we encourage you and, to do that. And as I'm reading this, Jay, I also kind of think, think it's like, are there people at specifically Warner Brothers Studios and Universal Studios that just kind of, you know, hold their temples and go, yeah, why did we sell those music companies? Because... Man, they 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 could really even out <laughs> yeah. the variable the variability of our movie television business now. Right. But you know they I couldn't mean, wait couldn't wait to get rid of those companies. Right, and we've talked about that. And also, it's you could say that about vinyl. Um, mm -hmm. The industry pretty much abandoned Absolutely. vinyl, and now there are new plants being uh, created, and it's become a different thing, which is, I think, a beautiful thing. But I think the bottom line with a lot of these forecasts, um, and, and certainly this media one, I think these companies that we mentioned that are buying up rights, they're going to look at this and they're going to apply that as one of their metrics as they determine yeah. what the value is of these assets they're buying and where they're going to go in, in the coming year. And before we move on, just really quickly, there are two stories that we're covering this week uh, from Media Research. It's, it's one of our favorite kind of sources for music news and analysis. And they take some of these complex things like forecasts and they make it really simple to understand and they explain why uh, they are. So highly encourage you if, if you're not subscribing to you know their newsletter or reading their blog or their pieces and you can purchase reports uh, from media that are super informative and can help you uh, to inform decisions about your business. Yes, indeed. Mark Mulligan, great job over there. And uh, boy, amazing stuff. So let's jump over to uh, story number two, Jay. Luminate releases the 2022 U.S. Mid-Year Report. Now, get out your acronym ring because you're not uh, your acronym ring. Just go back in time. You, Of course, Nielsen was a super well-known company. Then they went to, and I've even forgot this, they were Connect Next. Then they were MRC Data. Now they're Luminate. In case you're wondering, well, what's Luminate? 
that's who Luminate is. It's the company yeah. that we've known for a long time, but they keep changing their name for some reason. But uh, another interesting, um, super very interesting report. Um, by the way, the P in the PMRC data stands for Penske Media Corporation. So Penske and MRC data joined forces back in October of 2020, and hence... You know, we've got yeah. this, but don't forget, Bay, you know, and we've talked about this a lot, how influential SoundScan was when it launched back in 1991. And that's, yeah. MRC was was involved in that and that one of their brands. And, um, you know, it's 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 the amazing, the changing face of data in the, the music business in the last three decades. It's, yeah. it's, we've done such a turnaround because in those early days when we first got in the business, it was so loosey goosey. I don't know. I can't think of a better phrase for it. Loosey goosey, well, you know? Yeah. I was a billboard reporter. I was working at Tower Records and basically you would fill out a form and then these folks would call you once a week and say, what are your, you know, what's your top 50 albums? What are your top 50 singles that you had sold? And you didn't have to prove that. Um, and there was, it was rampant where you would have, um, people calling you saying, Hey, we really need this to be in your top 10 this week. We really, we're going for uh, number ones next week on this, you know, stuff like that. So um, I'm not saying that it was all um, wrong, but some of it was. And at our particular store, uh, we only reported accurately. Uh, we didn't play that game. Right. So um, in March of this year, um, the name was changed uh, to Luminate, and they launched a new website. It's uh, luminatedata.xyz, super easy to remember. Um, Luminate powers the billboard charts, um, and so that that's super important. You know, it brings together you know MRC data, Variety Business Intelligence, Music Connect that you talked about, even BDS, Broadcast Data Systems, which is mm -hmm. tracking radio, and of course we talked about SoundScan. So now that's all under kind of this one one umbrella and that's luminate. Okay. So we've got that out of the way. You know, I'm a longtime subscriber, uh, to SoundScan, music connect, luminate, all of this. Um, it's really great data. As you point out, um, they have data from 1991 until now, you know, for EPs, albums, tracks, which is awesome. Um, I'm also subscribing to the X us. Um, they call it global, but you know, as will page will point out, uh, rightly so. It's a handful of countries. It's not every other country on the planet for worldwide. Yeah. And they have only track data uh, from 2018 until now. Okay. So we're going to dig into this report. And there's really four takeaways that I would love to pull out of this report. It's such an amazing uh, report. And we love these annual reports. This is the one that comes out, you know, in the middle of the year, each year. And mm -hmm. a lot of people, a lot of these platforms, have these mid-year reports to just kind of give us a report card. So here are the four takeaways um, from this report. Number one, the increase in catalog streams. Number two, continued growth of vinyl. Number three, Latin music's ever-growing influence. And then number four, music traveling and connecting across global markets, right? We talked a little bit about these things in the last story. Um, I'd love for you to kick it off. Let's talk about the increase in catalog streams. Yeah, absolutely. The overall consumption of current music is down 1.4% over this point last year. Mm. However, catalog consumption continues to rise with a 19% increase over this time last year. It's also important to note that one-third of catalog streams so far in 2022 have been for songs released between 2017 and 2019. So it's interesting to see that, you know, that's going back five years uh, for some of those songs. Yeah. They're, and yet they are still super, super important when you're talking about what are people listening to? And right. but we've known that because we've worked in catalog over the years. And that's right. You know, ca catalog is always been the backbone, really. And that's it's sort of the stable part of the business because that would carry you through the lean years. And right. Catalog, it's not sexy, it's, but it's, it's not sexy, but it's super important. But, but you just uh, touched on two things that really jumped out at me. One is that overall consumption of current music is down 1.4%. I would consider that flat. And remember, that's not for the mm -hmm. year. That's just the first six months compared to the first six months last year. And then, you know, that a third of catalog streams so far in 2022 have been songs released between 2017 and 2019. Now, you and I talk all the time, like, what is catalog? Well, if you look at the definition, it's 18 months or older. But is that 
really catalog, right? Because some of those things are still yeah. being um, worked. Yeah, people are the, working the, yeah. tours around them. They're still being worked at radio. So that's going to push up that, um, that catalog number uh, quite a bit. Yeah. So yeah, interesting that that again the definition of what is catalog, and we've talked about that a lot, yeah. and it's certainly up for at least conversation in terms of kind of rejiggering uh, what truly you know what we what what truly is catalog, especially like you said, you know, an artist will be certainly touring, and there's just lots of things that I think would lead me to say we should revisit that and right. maybe change it a bit. I agree. And you and I talked about this once where maybe um, velocity could be a, a yes. better way um, to measure a catalog. So that's catalog, super uh, important to the business, such a big part of the business. The next part is vinyl. And uh, vinyl yeah. had only a slight increase in sales so far. Um, but, you know, on the retailer end, mass merchant stores have doubled their share of vinyl, um, you know, since 2019 you know, from 6% to 12%, you know, and I see that all the time, you know, when I'll walk through a Target store and I notice they're carrying more and more mm -hmm. uh, vinyl. And, you know, we still have Record Store Day, which I think is a beautiful thing for indie retail. Um, but I, I really was hoping that vinyl would kind of bring back a lot more of that lifeblood of indie retail, which our business is kind of built on. Um, so part of me is a little bit saddened when I see, you know, some of these uh, mass retailers jumping back on the bandwagon, but uh, support your local uh, record store, please. So anyway, up 6% uh, from 6 to 12% uh, vinyl uh, through mid-year 2022. So independent stores and online retailers still dominate that market. They're responsible, you know, uh, indie retailers is responsible for over half, 52%, and uh, online retail is uh, almost a third of all vinyl sales. Um, so that can be looked at as an indication of retailers like Target and Walmart more aggressively stocking and marketing vinyl products, especially you know their own exclusive variants. And we've talked a little bit about this, uh, a variant meaning that you know a different color. Um, maybe one will be uh, the one that you get at Target, maybe on red vinyl or clear vinyl, you know, which is different than maybe some other retailers. Um, so that's another reflection of vinyl's increasing value um, within the consumption landscape. It's and it's funny, and you know, you read about this stuff, and so you're here. We are talking about Target and Walmart, and you know, those people couldn't move those CD racks out fast enough, <laughs> and then all of a sudden, and then that's been a number of years, of course, when 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 that happened. But now to 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 see them coming back with physical product, it happens to be vinyl, of course, but it's just remarkable, and it's absolutely remarkable how that has happened, yeah. and the, and yeah, that you, you know, I I couldn't have imagined that coming back. But and yet here we are. So the next one also, of course, is Latin music. Boy, Jay, now you talk about you and I talk about Latin music a ton. The genre that has had the biggest victory so far in 2022 is Latin. Latin music had its highest streaming week ever in May. And you can't talk about Latin music without talking about Bad Bunny's album, right. Un Verano Senti. And that, of yes. course, so much is driven by that particular release. Yeah. Uh, during the tracking week ended, ending in, on May 12th, Latin music garnered 1.82 billion weekly on-demand audio streams, which surpassed wow. country for the first time, making Latin the fourth most popular genre in the U.S. behind pop, rock, and R&B hip-hop that week. Uh, Bad Bunny's share of U.S. of all U.S. Latin streaming consumption is five percent so far in 2022, and his album that we just mentioned held a 16 percent U.S. Latin streaming consumption share during its release week in May. Uh, yeah. So that is pretty, pretty, pretty remarkable that uh, an artist like that is dominating the genre and driving Huge. the genre to to yeah. to where we are. Not and surprising, you know, as well. Yes. And, and, and I got to admit, it, it wasn't that long ago that you and I maybe didn't cover Latin music as much as we should. Uh, and this is like last year, I think, uh, Bruno Del Granado from CAA yeah. sent us a little note. Um, super cool note. And he, he really caused us to take a look at Latin music. And when we did, and we started looking at touring and just how Latin music just dominates 
you know, a lot of these tours and how uh, massive Bad Bunny is. And it's not just Bad Bunny. There's there's a lot of other great uh, Latin artists. But Mm -hmm. now we talk about it regularly and it's in your morning coffee regularly. um, And it's that globalization that we talked about in the media report. It's a thing. It's a big yes. thing. And, and the last thing I wanted to touch on really quickly um, before we get into some of the uh, metrics is something that was new to this report, um, this new thing called the Luminate Similarity Score. And I, that had never been in any of their reports before. And it's really a measure of streaming similarity um, from one um, market to the next, you know, the crossover between popular songs in one country to other countries around the world. They call that the similarity score. So their goal in using the score was to more accurately illustrate the similarity or uniqueness of music markets. Okay. So for example, um, an obvious one would be the, the global data for the first half of 2022 shows that Canada had the most similarity with the U S right. That's not surprising. We're neighbors, English speaking Mm -hmm. primarily, you know, followed by Australia and New Zealand with both countries respectively seeing uh, almost 62 percent in uh, of their respective top 10,000 songs being the same in those markets. Right. As with the U.S., other English speaking countries follow closely with the U.K. having 54 percent, Ireland having 53 percent and so on. Right. The key factor proves true with other languages during the same time. Um, the top seven countries, most similarity to Mexico's streaming market, were all Spanish speaking. Bolivia, 58 percent. Ecuador, 58 uh, percent. Chile, Chile uh, 56 percent. Peru, et cetera. You know, so I think that's really interesting. And it just speaks to that globalization um, of music consumption. Absolutely. And certainly here, it's the Latinization of our country as well. You know, it's it is and again, we kind of hit on this earlier. It's, you know, I think um, the 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 our kids' generation of of music listeners are far more uh, likely to listen to to a, a language that they don't necessarily speak musically speaking. And so it's just it, it's changing kind of dynamics in the marketplace that yeah. that are you know, driving a lot of this stuff. But I love this kind of similarity thing, which is yeah. really fascinating to you know comparing yeah. with different countries. It's very very cool. So let's look at, uh, just to wrap the story up, let's look at the mid-year in metrics from this Luminate report. Um, And I'll start with uh, total album consumption. Now, just so everyone understands what that is, it includes TEA and on-demand SEA. Well, what is that? TEA equals track equivalent album. So that's one to 10. You know, you have 10 downloads, let's say, and that equals Mm -hmm. an album sale. TEA is less important today with downloads being down so much, but but that's part of this equation. So that's TEA, track equivalent albums. The other part of that is SEA, which is streaming equivalent albums. So the Billboard uh, Top 200 includes two tiers of on-demand audio streams. Tier one is paid subscription audio streams, and that's 1,250 streams equal one album unit. Okay, paid subscription, 1,250 streams, equal one album, in, and, and that's SEA. Tier two, ad-supported, those audio streams, you got you to gotta have more of those to equal an album. That's 3,750 um, streams equal one album unit. Okay, so that's TEA and SEA. So we get back to you know, these mid-year metrics. The total album consumption was up 9.3%, and that in- includes that TEA and SEA. Mm-hmm. Total digital music consumption... Um, That was up 10.6%. And those are digital albums plus TEA and on-demand SEA. And just really quickly, on-demand streaming, um, that includes audio and video. That was up 11.6%. And again, first six months versus uh, six months last year. Um, On-demand streaming audio only was up 12.4%. On-demand streaming video up 6.3%. Yeah, interestingly, total album sales, physical and digital, down 8.4%. Digital album sales, down 19.6%. Physical album sales, down 4.7%. CD album sales, down 10.7%. And vinyl LP sales, uh, up 1%. So basically kind um, kind of just flat. Now, of course... The asterisk, I would say, in yes. all of that stuff is that 
Okay, but we know and have heard so much about the the challenging of manufacturing vinyl. If that weren't the case, what would these numbers be? And it's you, you, there's no way to know. Um, but I, you know, I, my guess is that would change somewhat dramatically depending on how much production capacity we could in, increase vinyl uh, production by. But uh, you know, that certainly is kind of I would imagine putting uh, a, a bit of a, a hamper on on these numbers. And then digital track sales down 21.4 percent. No surprise there, I suppose, because uh, although I still <laughs> buy digital <laughs> tracks most people yeah. don't i think uh I, I still like to kind of have them in my hard drive permanently yeah but that's jumping back really quickly age. to your your vinyl number i think you're absolutely right you know if we had the capacity to actually fulfill all of those orders what would that look like and also we're comparing you know apples to chainsaws when you talk about the first six months of last year and you know, whether that's Adele or some of these really big sellers on yeah. vinyl compared to this. I think that's why the annual report, I think, will even out a little bit more. I think so, too. Um, we'll, we'll see how that goes. And then the last kind of metrics in this story is, and we talked about this a little bit, is catalog versus current. Um, yeah. Catalog, you know, that consumption was up 14%. Um, really big increase. Uh, current album consumption, as you mentioned, is down 1.4%. Uh, let's call it flat. Um, and again, we'll see how that um, fleshes out for the annual report. But love looking at these uh, these reports. Great report from Luminate. Yes, indeed. Now known as Luminate, which is a far better name than any of the other names. They should have hit Luminate like <laughs> 10 years ago. It's a, it's a good yes, name. sir. So, yes, indeed. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to our third story, Jay. Also from Media. Changing streaming's royalty model will unlock a new music economy. And for this, you do need to add a new acronym into your acronym decoder ring because that's what we're going to be talking about. It's uh, right. there's a new one. And right. I'll let you start as I get the well, article up. Sure. Um, I think um, we dig into this uh, in a better way with our Will Page interview, not to continually... Uh, um, yes. Beat that into the ground. But we it really is a great interview with Will. Um, and we will talk about user centric versus pro rata. Right. Um, those are kind of the two ways um, that are out there right now. SoundCloud um, uses user centric. Most everybody else uses pro rata. And there could be and, uh, a change coming. And what I love about um, this article from Media. Um, and this is by Chris uh, Thakrar. Um, it's, I don't remember a piece recently where it really dug into what would happen if we switched from pro rata to user centric, you know, how would, uh, people, would they get paid more? Would artists get p paid more from that? Exactly. There are people they... who have made guesses about it, but this is the first time that I can remember where someone kind of did the math, did the research and said, here it is. Yes. And by the way, the other another name, and this is the new acronym for user centric is FPR, fan powered. Uh, so so that's something that I I mean, I've heard it briefly, but now we're I'm sure FPR or fan powered is going to be really kind of the new thing that we I, and I like that better than user centric, to be honest. Um, yeah. So let's let's jump into the key insights of this, because sure. it really is fascinating. As you said, you know, it's like we've talked about it a lot. You know, what would be the difference? And a lot of people have kind of poo pooed and said, no, it's not going to make a big dramatic difference. So some of the key insights in this is the majority, which is 56 percent of the 118,000 creator sample that media analyzed who are currently in the F. PR, which is user centric or now fan powered uh, um, earnings, are better off under FPR than pro rata. Okay, so they're better off. FPR has enabled more artists to move up into higher income brackets with a 9.2% increase in artists earning over $1,000 in the 11 month period between April of 2021 and February of 2022. Okay, right. so we've got some numbers now to kind of actually yeah. consider. Yeah, I think that's important. And and before we kind of dig into all of these uh, insights, which I think are spot on, you know, Chris points out that most streaming services operate, you know, a pro rata model, which, you know, at a simple le level, 
um, pools all the money generated on a streaming platform and pays out to the um, rights holders, you know, their share of total streams. Okay, in this model, fans end up paying for the most popular artists, whether they listen to them or not. That's the problem, right? If I listen to The Accidentals all month, they don't get my nine ninety nine, right? Many artists feel that the value of their fans is lost in that model. A fan could spend all their time streaming a handful of artists, but the value of that fan subscription will not make it to them, as I just pointed out. Uh, creators are still paid uh, fractions of a uh, penny uh, per stream. And again, he states in here, you know, that artists are being paid, but as you and I talk about, it's, it's the rights holders uh, that are yes. paid. And, and I know he knows that, um, a model to capture the value for fans, you know, like last year, SoundCloud took a step forward, you know, with that new powered user centric, but what they're calling fan powered royalties, FPR fan powered royalties. This model is also known as user centric. Um, what this means um, in heavily simplified terms, is that fans only pay for the artists that they listen to. So I just wanted to, I know you and I talk about that every week, but for those that are just tuning in, just so you kind of wrap your head around these two models that we're talking about. Yeah, exactly. But it is, I mean, it's dense stuff. And it is one of the frustrating things that that for a lot of artists, in, and listen, who doesn't want to make a living with their music? And I totally get that. Um, and with, with, of course, the SoundCloud changes that this, it's why it was kind of bringing this to the forefront. Um, as the, as this, uh, one of the other key insights, artists want to be able to find fans and make a living from their music instead of chasing fame and fortune. Fan-powered royalties has helped 63% of artists with 100 to 100,000 fans earn more from their fans than the pro rata method ah. artists artists who earned more under fan powered royalties uh, receive 42 percent of their income from their super fans that's those who contribute more than 10 percent a month a category that makes up 1.9 percent of their total audience we talk about super fans a lot and how important yeah. that potentially is huge in in the way artists uh you know the way artists make money um uh, fan-powered ro royalty incentivizes and rewards artists who are not only building but also monetizing their super fans. Yeah. Superstars with an audience of over 100,000 typically have the smallest share of super fans at 1.3%. With fan-powered royalties incentives, they have the biggest opportunity to engage and grow their super fans. Let's, let's look at that again. That was really surprising to me. Read that me first sentence. That was super surprising. Superstars with an audience of over 100,000 typically have the smallest share of superfans at 1.3%. I would have thought that would be more. Um, but I guess if, if I think about it, you know, some of these massive artists, you know, I, I'm fans of them and I'll listen to yes. their stuff, but I'm a hardcore fan of some of these indie things and I devote a lot of my listening, you know, and as you and I talk about, if, if I love a song, I will listen to that thing 20 <laughs> times in a row. You know, I, I'm <laughs> freaky too. that way. And then, you know, I, um, I got a new album over the weekend um, from a client and I can't stop listening to it. I've played it over and over and I hear new things every time because there's different yeah. layers to that onion. And so I guess it surprised me initially, um, but maybe not after you think about it a little bit. Well, I think when, when you look at it as a percentage it might be low, but of course, if you're Kiss and and 1.3 percent of your fans are super fans, then that's a big number. Um, even though 1.3 percent is not a, a necessarily a, a large ratio number, but it's a big number. And nobody is nobody has tapped into the super fan market better than Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley. Those guys know how to tap into their super fans. Um, so uh, fan powered royalties reward quality of fans, not quantity of streams. That's really important. Again, yeah. uh, fan powered royalties reward quality of fans, not quantity of streams, catching out inauthentic bots and listeners who are paid to repeatedly stream. There is less incentive to game the system, thus facilitating authentic fandom. And that right there might be the best argument for moving to this particular for, right to, to, to use to uh to get to user-centric that's yeah that's probably yeah. really important 
I, I agree. And that's something that's near and dear to my heart. If you listen to this podcast a week or two ago, I interviewed uh, Jen Mosse and we talked about bots and spin farms and how mm-hmm. rampant that problem is and what they're doing to combat it. And uh, this, I think you're absolutely right. Fan powered royalties uh, would be the way to go because it disincentivizes that key point. Indeed. Fan-powered royalty's greatest value is the insight that it provides into artists' biggest contributing fans, helping artists better monetize their fans and navigate the industry-wide shift towards fandom fragmentation. Unlocking deep fan insight opens the opportunity to build a fan-centric music economy that is based on fandom and the audience's economic contribution. Um, yeah. Really well thought out, all of oh these things. Oh my gosh. And, and this has been the best. Yeah, and I, boy, I, I think you're going to put me in the in the camp of of fan powered uh, royalties because yeah. or user centric. It really uh, these things are me. Now, here my question to you: You might, you, you know, we, we let's let's kind of guess. So let's just say Spotify woke, wakes up tomorrow and they want to switch over to this. Wow, what would that take just in terms of data collection and rejiggering an entire back? office system to to switch to maybe maybe not a lot or maybe well a ton of work no it is definitely work and i talked to somebody um at a dsp about this like how could you switch over and they it seems obvious now but it didn't to me at the time is that you don't just hit a switch what you do is you start doing um fpr alongside of pro rata but you're still paying pro rata and Mm -hmm. what you do is you do that for a few months and then what you do is at the end of that term, because it's typically a month um, where they pay out from those pools, is after you see that everything's working and everything's uh, right, then you can flip the switch because you've already got it and some historical data. And you do it at the end of that term and you let people know way ahead of time that things are going to be changing. Um, so. Is it a lot of work? It can be because there's going to be um, new accounting and uh, yeah. new programs to keep track of it and new ways of reporting and all of that. So I think that you know studies on user-centric have usually been done from a theoretical and a restricted kind of geographical view until now. And this media white paper that you and I just pulled these key insights from, you can click a link in that story that we've been talking about in your morning coffee, and it'll give you that white paper for free with all those insights yeah. that you and yeah. I just mentioned. So again, the, the, the headline of this media piece, and it's in your morning coffee, changing streaming's royalty model will unlock a new music economy. Uh, a brilliant piece um, by Chris Thakrar, um, over at media and take a look at it. I think that you may change your mind about um, FPR user centric uh, versus the big pool uh, or pro rata model. You know what I'm looking for and I'll be reaching out in the coming uh, days and weeks is we need to have our friend Chris Castle take a look mm-hmm. at this. Um, yes. Chris is probably, you know, uh, the brightest guy in the room. Um, he's a music business attorney who we've had on on this show uh, to talk about things. And he has a website called Music Technology Policy that we follow religiously. And I'm going to reach out to him um, because he always has a really good take on all of these issues for the music industry. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to hear what he has to say about it. Um, he can be a contrary voice or he can be a... <laughs> <laughs> uh, joining the bandwagon voice. So we'll see which one we get when we chat with him. But now look into your crystal ball, Jay. If you were a betting man in five years, do you think we'll still have the same model? And do you think that might morph into more of a user centric model? Um, I think that it'll be FPR in five years yeah, across so the too. board. Yeah, I think so too. I think so too. Well, let's see uh, how good our crystal balls work. It, I can tell you mine doesn't work great for stocks. <laughs> so maybe it works a little bit better for looking at the way they monetize streaming. We'll see. Well, we it's see funny. At the beginning of each year, I forget what the publication is. I've done this a few times where there are predictions and they'll ask mm-hmm. me like, you know, w- next year, where do you yeah. see things going? And I, it's about 50-50. You know, I think... Uh, 
a couple of years ago, we were talking about things like NFTs and Web3. Um, and we were talking about coming out of the uh, pandemic and those kinds of things. But if history has taught us anything, it's that there will be something, you know, next year, yeah. you know, this non DSP revenue that we're talking about, you touched on it's, there's always something, right? There is always something. And if nothing else, the world will throw you a curveball sometimes and things you couldn't possibly contemplate suddenly come into play. So there is that as well. But on that note, Jay, what do you say we wrap up the episode? We will get uh, get to the back to the rest of our day. We do want to thank, of course, Banzoogle, Hypebot, and Bands in Town. Wonderful folks, wonderful uh, appreciation on our side from, uh, from them to them for helping us with the podcast. We could not do it without them. Great, great. And of course, stuff that we've products we've been using since the beginning and so we are yeah. super pleased Absolutely. to be able to have them on the team which is awesome and jay have a fabulous week and everyone else have a fabulous week thanks for joining us this time we appreciate you tuning in to us and we will of course be back next week with episode 102 so let us sign off and thank you and we will be back next time with the your morning coffee podcast <laughs>